So we start now uh, looking at some uses of the dynamic model. We will go back to the standard case of rigid manipulators. Uh, and the first thing that we can consider is its use, the use of the dynamic model for inverse dynamics. So suppose that we have a, a desired trajectory in the joint space. So a Q equal to Q desired of T. We suppose that is, this trajectory is at least twice differentiable so that we can have a, a, um, a acceleration Q double dot desired of T. And indeed, uh, we may not need to start directly from the joint space. This could also come from some uh, inversion of a trajectory in the task space. At this level, we may consider also redundancy and resolve redundancy in a special way, locally and globally, uh, so that eventually we are uh, now given a, a trajectory in the joint space. Now, if we consider, let's say, the full model, including a motor and dissipative effect of the viscous and Coulomb type, we can compute uh, the desired torque in order to execute this motion by replacing Q desired and its first and second derivative in the full model in this way. So the tau desired, the torque that the motor needs to generate beyond the reduction ratio, remember, uh, is equal to M Q desired plus BM multiplied by the desired acceleration plus the Coriolis and centrifugal and gravity term uh, evaluated along the trajectory and also plus the torque needed to compensate for the dissipation due to friction of the viscous and of the Coulomb type. Now, as you can see, we have derived the full dynamic model with our Euler-Lagrange equation and then we just evaluate algebraically, as we already said, uh, all the terms to compute at any instant of time the needed torque. However, uh, well, first of all, this, uh, is not, this inverse dynamics will be typically part of a control scheme. Uh, in particular, it will generate in nominal condition the feed-forward term in our control scheme. Uh, already when we talk about uh, kinematic control, we mentioned that in robotics, a good control is always a combination of the two actions, the feed-forward action, which is coming from the desired motion, and in this case, using the dynamic information that we have on our robot, plus a feedback part, which is there to make the behavior robust to uncertainty, uh, external disturbance, and so on. So certainly this inverse dynamics can be used also for control. It can be computed offline, so we don't have an issue of computational time, but many times, uh, all this information, in particular the value of the desired trajectory at the current instant of Q, Q dot and Q double dot desired, may be coming from sensor information. So even this feed forward part, uh, may be, uh, we may need to evaluate this in real time. So for doing this, uh, we will not use the Euler-Lagrange expression. Although we have a closed form here, but this would be probably too complex to compute in real time. Why? Because if the number of joint increases, the extension of the symbolic term uh, will grow in an exponential, exponential way. So if you look, for instance, at the element 1, 1 of the inertia matrix of the Stanford manipulator, this is already long enough. Huh? And if you have a, a robot with uh, 8 degrees of freedom, a manipulator, uh, then this will grow even, even larger than that. And evalu evaluate, or better said, uh, writing down all this expression and then evaluating them numerically with the given value of QD, 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 desired, QD desired, Q dot desired, and Q double dot desired, it's not the best way of doing things. And in fact, uh, I anticipate that 
uh, when we have to do this numerical computation in real time, we will use instead the no Newton Euler method. So working directly with uh, numeric quantities without ever building up the full model and then evaluating it numerically. Although the result will be the same, but in terms of computational time needed for do this, we will have a, a, a factor of 10 or 100 of improvement in general. And this is particularly true when we have uh, a large number of degrees of freedom. Of course, if we have to compute this for the planar to our arm, then we can certainly use directly the uh, symbolic expression and then evaluate this term numerically. What about the direct dynamics? Now, uh, this is a quite important both for theory and for practice because let's rewrite them in a compact way uh, our equation like this. If there are extra terms, just include extra term. I'm just reducing to the minimum uh, the, um, the extension of the model. So we have the inertial term, mq, q double dot, some colorless and centrifugal term, g of q gravity term, and then all non-conservative forces. It could be including a, a dissipative one or only actuation torques. Now, direct dynamics means we need to, we specify some input, u, so we assume that on the right hand side uh, we have only actuation torque at this, at this moment, otherwise we will move the dissipative terms on the left hand side and we have to integrate this differential equation. In order to do this, you integrate this equation numerically so you use some integration routine which are available in your simulation package, for instance, Simulink. So either you do this uh, in a MATLAB environment, so you use the function like the ODE, which is the integration using Runge Kutta, fourth order Runge Kutta, or you set up a Simulink scheme, so a, a, a iconic diagram which represents your differential equation, and then you call from the menu one of the integration routine. No matter what you do, you have to put this into a form of a state space equation because uh, integration routine typically integrate first order differential equation while these are second order differential equation. So uh, this step is quite easy. You have to define a state and the most simple choice is to define the 2n dimensional state as given by the generalized coordinates and their first derivative, so q and q dot. Now, we have to write down the state equation for uh, this choice of the state. Remember, this choice is not unique. This is the most natural, but uh, not the only one. So we have to write an equation, a first order equation for x1, which is an n-dimensional vector, and a first order equation for x2. This equation are, takes this form. The first set, so x dot, the first set x dot 1, well, we look at their definition, the derivative of x1, so it's the derivative of q, so it's q dot, which is nothing else than se the second set of, of uh, state variable. So the first set of equation is trivial. x1 dot is equal to x2, and there's no input appearing at this stage. Why? Because the input appears only at the differential, at the second order differential level, at the level of acceleration. So we write down the second set of state equations, so the evolution in time of x2, so the derivative of x2, x2 dot, but x2 is q dot, so it's first time derivative is q double dot, and this is why we need to isolate from the model, from our second order model, the acceleration. And we are guaranteed that we can do this because m of q is always invertible. It's always invertible because it's a positive definite matrix for any configuration Q. Remember that also a negative definite matrix would always be invertible, a matrix which has no definition in terms of its positive or negative uh, definiteness may encounter some singularity and in some configuration you may not be capable of inverting that matrix. 
But this is not our case, so it's positive definite guarantees invertibility. So we can always isolate acceleration from the model, and we write then, uh, we bring back everything on the left hand side, on the right hand side. So we pre multiply by the inverse of m, which is evaluated at the current q, which is x1, and the other terms are c of x1, x2, so of the full state g of x1 only of the configuration there's a minus sign because we have brought these terms to the other side and then we have m to the minus one pre multiplying also the input so we have the inverse of the inertia matrix multiplying on the bottom part of the state equation the input that we uh, apply to the system now in this form we recognize that these are first order differential equation you can always move from n second order differential equation to 2n first order differential equation, which means introducing the state for your system. And the right hand side contains a vector field, this is the terminology, it's called also a drift, which is a vector, 2n dimensional vector, which is nonlinear because the second part uh, is a nonlinear function of the state, plus an input matrix, which is 2n by n times the n inputs that you can apply to the system. So this is a nonlinear system, but of a very particular form. It's not the most general nonlinear system, which would be written, let's say, in this form, x dot equal phi of x and u. So a nonlinear function of the state and also of the input. Here, the input appear in a linear fashion. In fact, they are outside nonlinear function of X. And this is a general property of all mechanical systems. So there is a class of method of analysis and control of this particular class of nonlinear systems. So it's very convenient and ro robots have been uh, kind of a benchmark for many application of advanced nonlinear controls. But this is the form in which you have to uh, provide that you have to provide to a numerical integrator routine like uh, Adams Bashford or Runge Kutta, which uh, take name different name according to the uh, envi simulation environment. For instance, in MATLAB, ODE is one of such integrator. You have to provide equation in the state space format, not in the second order format. So this is one way of doing things. And you see that for solving now. Uh, you input some evaluation for the some evolution in time of the input u and you have to integrate this numerically and in the direct dynamic problem that we are facing in this way we have to invert the inertia matrix the inversion the inertia matrix needs to be inverted in this case whereas in the computation of the nominal torque that produces some motion so in the inverse dynamic problem we don't need to invert the inertia matrix now this is a basic difference. So we can do it, but of course computation is more, more demanding. So uh, integration, integrating this equation can be done only numerically. However, let me say that this is not the only possible choice of state variable. Another very common choice is to replace the velocities q dot with what is called generalized momentum of the system. If you have a, a single mass m, which has a speed v, the momentum of this concentrated mass is m times its velocity v. Here we have a multi-link system, multi-body system with various links which change configuration. But we can define still a vector term, uh, which has the same dimension of the generalized coordinates which is the product of the inertia matrix of the robot times the velocity is q dot. This is a natural generalization. Now, you see that this is a new set of state variable, which is one to one related. Uh, we can go from the set x to the set x tilde in a bidirectional invertible way. Okay, so this is a new set of state. And of course, we can write state equation by using x tilde one and x tilde two. Uh, just like we did before. And I leave you this as a, a very useful exercise. You can generate this 
right hand side and you will recognize uh, a number of properties. You may use in this expression the properties that we have learned about the various components of the, of the uh, dynamic model, in particular the fact that uh, the C vector can be factorized uh, using a matrix S, so it can be written as S of Q, Q dot times Q dot, and there's a special choice for S such that M dot minus 2S is Q symmetric. You can use this inside the expression of this new state equation. So this is uh, what you would do, for instance, for a generic two degrees of freedom robot. Of course, this can be generalized. If you're solving the direct dyna dynamics, so you're simulating the system dynamics, for instance, using Simulink. This is a Simulink-like block scheme. So you have integrator, so you start from the, from the end, you have uh, Q1 and Q2 are your two generalized coordinates of interest. If you had more links, more joints, you may border this uh, with other pairs of integrators, one pair for each uh, joint. So you have the integration. Um, before the integration, you have Q1 dot. Before the second integration, you have Q1 double dot. And this for all the components. And this acceleration is being generated by the product of the inverse of the inertia matrix times the number of uh, contribution. First of all, the u, so m to the minus 1 times u is the input part. But m to the minus 1 times minus c minus g are also the other term coming from the uh, drift of the system. So the evolution of the system which is there even if u is equal to 0. So all these blocks, uh, you don't need to write them explicitly in Simulink. In fact, uh, you use, uh, you call user-defined MATLAB function, which evaluates G, evaluates C, using the current value of the state. Here you need only Q, so you only need these two variables, Q1 and Q2. Uh, for the Coriolis and centrifugal term, you need also the velocity Q1 dot and Q2 dot in this case, or Q dot in a more, more general, higher dimensional uh, degrees of freedom robot. And similarly, you use Q in order to compute the matrix M numerically, and then invert it numerically. So in this block, which is calling a, a MATLAB function, you have also the instruction invert, uh, inverse of M. You invert M numerically. So you first evaluate with the current value of Q and then you invert the numerical matrix. So if you have a, uh, this two degree of freedom robot, you're inverting a two by two numerical matrix. If you have a six degrees of freedom robot, you invert a six by six numerical matrix, which is the evaluation of your uh, inertia matrix M of Q. Okay, so this is the general st story. In the, in the, uh, you never, never put inside the blocks uh, numerical values, parameters. Uh, just launch in MATLAB uh, an initializing files, which defines the numerical value of all dynamic parameters and kinematic parameters as well. So linked length, then avitar number parameter, masses, inertia, center of masses, and so on. So all these symbols will take a number, uh, a numeric value, and inside these codes, there is only the symbolic expression, which is being evaluated numerically. No symbolic terms, just their uh, algebraic expression. And of course, in order to run a simulation, you have to choose a numerical integration method with some parameters like the simulation step size, duration of the simulation, and so on. And this can be done from the menu, for instance, of the Simulink environment. Now, another use of the model is that the model is nonlinear. But when you're approaching, uh, let's say, a final destination, for instance, you're considering a point-to-point -point task for your robot. You have to go from one configuration where you pick an object to another configuration where you pick an object. While moving under the command of your motor torques, the dynamics is fully nonlinear. But when you're approaching the final destination where you have to stop at zero velocity 
and you would like to stay there in an equilibrium, in fact, so that if you reach that configuration, you will stay there forever until you have a next task, then your locally, your dynamics can be approximated by a linear model. So how do we do this uh, linear approximation? Now, of course, the linear model can be used later on for designing uh, a feedback controller that will stabilize this equilibrium configuration uh, despite the presence of disturbance or somebody pushing the arm away from that location and you still would like to preserve this. So this is uh, made by linear control methods which are based on the linear approximation of the system around this equilibrium. Well, the same can be done, the same can be done uh, also when you're approximating the behavior while the robot is moving along a nominal trajectory you can do uh, a, an approximation when you're getting out of the nominal trajectory by a small amount and you can end up with an approximate linear model along a trajectory the trajectory is called the equilibrium trajectory not just the equilibrium state but the method is more or less the same in the slide you will see the approximate linearization expression also for the trajectory, but for the time being we will just consider approximate linearization around an equilibrium point. So how do you do this? By approximating the nonlinear term uh, by Taylor Serial expansion up to the first order. So uh, we will see the approximation, the linear approximation around the constant equilibrium state. Pay attention, it needs to be an equilibrium state. It cannot be a generic state because otherwise, if you start from there, uh, you will move autonomously away while you don't want to do this. Either it's a natural equilibrium, so an equilibrium where the system would remain without any action of the control, or is a controlled equilibrium, so it's an equi a state which becomes an, an equilibrium after the application of some command. Uh, or you can do the linearization around an equilibrium trajectory, which is the nominal trajectory of motion, the one that you should follow if nothing strange happens, if you don't have uncertainty, if you don't have uh, uh, external disturbances and so on. But as, long, as soon as you have this type of things, you will deviate from the nominal trajectory and as long as you remain close to this nominal trajectory, you can use an approximate linearized model along the trajectory, which is the equilibrium one. So the equilibrium state is uh, a state made of a generic configuration QE and zero velocity. Remember that in order to stay in a position for a mechanical system, uh, the state should have zero velocity component. Otherwise you will move away. This is quite natural. So if you take the model and replace q dot is equal to zero, so the Coriolis and centrifugal terms are gone, and you like to stay here, so you don't want to move away, so you don't want to have an acceleration which is different from zero. Otherwise, you will get in the next state a velocity, and then you will move out of this state. So if you impose zero acceleration, zero velocity, and a generic QA such that you are in equilibrium, then what remains in the model is G of QE and on the other side some equilibrium torque which should balance gravity. If you don't have this torque applied on the right hand side, this will not be an equilibrium unless you are in a configuration QE which zeroes the gravity. So this is a natural equilibrium without control. If you would like to render any other configuration and equilibrium, you have to apply the torque that compensate the gravity. If you look at my arm, and I would like to stay here in equilibrium without applying a torque, I would fall. So this is not an equilibrium. Instead, if I would like to be exactly on the vertical, this, I don't need to apply a torque to stay there. But if I give a small perturbation, I will fall. So this is an equilibrium but it's an unstable equilibrium without control. Whereas this lower configuration is a configuration where G of QE is again zero, 
but it's another type of equilibrium because if I move it out, I will come back. So this is a asymptotically stable equilibrium. We'll see all this concept when we will deal with uh, control, but in fact, uh, a state, equilibrium state, needs to have a torque which balances gravity. So if I apply the right torque in this configuration, the one that balances only the gravitational term, then I will stay there and this is an equilibrium, okay? Now, uh, this is important because uh, the approximate linearization can be made only around an equilibrium. So we assume that the QE, whatever it is, uh, is such that we are also applying a UE which balance gravity. If this is zero, then we don't need to apply anything. But in general, we need a balancing torque. What about the equilibrium trajectory? Uh, we will not deal with the, the linearization around this, but same story. Uh, it's an evolution of states where Q is equal to some nominal desired trajectory and of course Q dot should be the derivative of this. And also, since we have to preserve this motion, also the acceleration should be equal to the desired acceleration. What about the third derivative, the jerk? Should this be equal to the desired jerk? Yes, probably, but this is not needed for our system because all what we need in the model is up to the second order derivative of the desired motion. So what is the desired uh, nominal equilibrium trajectory? Is one where plugging in the right hand side the desired motion, we have on the, on the left hand side, we have on the right hand side exactly the torque that is computed through inverse dynamics. Which means simply that if you would like to do this motion with your arm, so my joints are moving such that my end effector is making this kind of sinusoidal motion, I need to apply in nominal condition the equilibrium torque story that will let my motion be realized. So the inverse dynamics. Okay, so you see that this, when you have a time varying trajectory, plays the role of a constant torque when you have just an equilibrium state, okay? And you will realize, you will approximate the, line, the dynamic behavior of the robot either around this trajectory or around this equilibrium state. Now, uh, approximate linearization is something that you may have encountered in some other courses before. Uh, you have to do this now, you typically do this uh, on the nonlinear state equation. Now, the nice thing is that we can do exactly the same thing for a mechanical system, in particular for robots, just working on the second order dynamics. So, not going through the, uh, uh, the state representation and then linearizing the right hand side with a Taylor expansion up to the first order. So, throwing away all the terms that are quadratic or higher order in the variation. So the result is the same, but it's, I will show how to do this directly on the second order model for the linearization at an equilibrium state. So what, what do you do? You uh, write the generic configuration Q as the one at the equilibrium plus a small variation delta Q. And similarly, the velocity around the equilibrium velocity, which is zero, plus a small velocity variation. So Q dot is replaced by delta Q dot. And similarly, the acceleration, wherever you encounter acceleration, you replace it by the equilibrium acceleration, which is again zero, times a small variation of the acceleration. And similarly, on the right hand side, you are approximating your control by applying the nominal equilibrium command plus a small variation of uh, torque, delta U, okay? Now, if you plug in all this expression into the model and then you throw away all terms where at least a product of small variation appears, so a variation of the second infinitesimal order, then you obtain exactly the linear approximation. So, 
uh, if you do this, no? take uh, all terms which have a quadratic dependence on deltas, in particular the C terms uh, are being uh, eliminated completely. Why? Because they are quadratic in the velocities. So for each Q dot you replace delta Q, uh, delta Q dot, so there will be only, always product of delta Q dot square and these are infinitesimal of higher order so they vanish. The inertial term here all, the only thing that remains is the inertia matrix evaluated at the configuration times the variation of the acceleration. Okay, because uh, uh, if you consider the variation in, inside of Q, then this will multiply the variation of the acceleration, so it's a product of two variations, and this vanishes when the variation are small enough. For the gravity term, the remaining one, you will have the gravity term evaluated at the configuration, QE, at the equilibrium configuration, plus the variation of G over Q evaluated at the variation times the increment delta Q. This is really the linear expansion of G of Q, the Taylor expansion. And all the rest is inside this infinitesimal terms, which is a higher order infinitesimal of delta Q and delta Q dot. And on the right hand side, you have, again, you have replaced U by U equilibrium plus delta U. And now you recognize that this torque is exactly cancelling the gravity. This is why we are doing things at the equilibrium with the right torque needed to stay at the equilibrium. You neglect infinitesimal order of second or higher, uh, infinitesimal terms of second or higher order. And you baptize this, which is a matrix, is the gradient of the gravity vector with respect to the vector of generalized coordinates. So this becomes a matrix evaluated at the equilibrium configuration. So this becomes G of QE, which is similar to the matrix of inertia evaluated at the equilibrium. And now you define uh, a state space, which is given by the variation of delta Q and the variation of delta Q dot exactly like we did for the original state. And so we write the variation of the first set of state variable and delta Q dot is nothing else than the second set of state variable. So you have for the first set of equation zero identity times delta X, so delta X two, if you wish, while delta X double dot is, uh, sorry, the second component, delta x2 dot, so it's delta q double dot. You isolate this from this equation, so you pre-multiply everything by the inverse of the inertia matrix at the configuration of equilibrium. So you will have minus uh, m to the minus 1 qe times this matrix times delta q, which is the first set of delta x equation. So this goes into the first block multiplying delta x1 and then there's nothing else left for delta x2 and same story for the delta u uh, you have the inversion of the inertia matrix multiplying just the delta u so you end up with a, a linear system now in delta x rather than in x to signify that we are uh, looking at the linear approximation around the equilibrium and this is in the form of a standard linear system, A delta X plus B delta U. Okay, now on this linear system, you can apply any of the techniques that you know for, uh, of control techniques that you know, um, like uh, assigning poles or assigning uh, eigenvalues and things like that. Okay, now another very important uh, use of the model is understanding what happens if you change coordinates from the beginning. It's exactly the generalization of what we have seen for the uh, actuated pendulum where we have derived all the model using the link coordinate and then at the end we said what if we had used from the beginning the motor coordinate as generalized coordinate. So here is same story. Suppose that you have 
derive the model using the generalized coordinate Q, an n-dimensional set locally in Rn. Uh, so you have wrote, written the equation in this form, m of q, q double dot plus c, q, q double dot plus g of q. Now for compactness, I will collect c and, and g into a single vector which I label as n of q, q dot. And then on the right hand side, we have the non-conservative forces performing work on q. And this is why I'm adding now a subscript Q to remember that they are the uh, terms that appear on the right hand side when we are using the coordinates Q to describe the dynamics of our system. Now suppose that we want to change coordinate and let's call P the new set of coordinates. There are many possible choices that you can think of. Now, let me do this for, for the 2R planner robot. Suppose that you have this system and you have used Q1, so this is x0, y0. You have used Q1 and Q2 as coordinates. So Q, Q1 and Q2 using these two angles, the denavit hartenberg theta angles, you have derived your model in this form. And now suppose there are two possible change of coordinate that you may be interested. One is given by P1, P2, and P1 will leave it equal to Q1, and P2 is just Q1 plus Q2. So you are using the same first angle, but you will like, you prefer uh, using P2 as the absolute angle with respect to the x-axis, so the sum of Q1 and Q2. So this is a transformation which I can call f of Q. In particular, it's a linear transformation and I can write it as 1, 0, 1, 1 times Q. So let's call this J of Q. It's a matrix. In general, I could have also a nonlinear one. For instance, I can use as P prime another possible change of coordinates, uh, F prime of Q. And now, uh, if this is L1 and this is L2, I'm using L1 sine of Q1 plus L2 sine, uh, sorry, so, sine, huh? no, cosine of 1, 2, and L1, S1, plus L2, S1, 2. What is this? I'm using these two coordinates, P prime 1 and P prime 2, for representing the dynamics. So I'm using the coordinate, for instance, uh, of the end effector. These are related to the coordinate, the joint coordinate that I'm using. So you see that I can change coordinate in many ways. Of course, this is a nonlinear transformation, and I assume that this transformation is invertible. So I have to assume that I'm doing this out of singularity of the direct kinematics. If I'm uh, writing p dot prime, I will have df prime over dq uh, times q dot, so I will have j prime of q, q dot, and this Jacobian needs to be invertible. In this case, I have that p dot is equal to j q dot because the transformation was linear, you know, and so the same matrix that appears in the linear transformation appears also at the differential level. So this Jacobian is constant and non-singular, as you can see. This Jacobian is function of Q and may have the singularity when the arm is stretched or folded, as we know. But now the idea is uh, we use another set. Uh, it could be the Cartesian 
coordinate, or could be just a transformation, linear or nonlinear, of the original coordinate. And we would like not to start from scratch, but see what are the effects on the various dynamic terms in the model. Okay? So, uh, we have this type of mapping, P equal F of Q. Remember, the number of P should be equal to the number of Q. Otherwise, either the Q were not generalized coordinate or the P are not generalized coordinate in the sense the minimum number and not the redundant number of variable needed to uniquely characterize the configuration of the arm. If I do this uh, using this, pay attention. Of course, this is uniquely connected to Q1, Q2, just locally, as long as I'm not crossing a singularity, because associated to these values of P1 and P2, I have also another inverse kinematic solution. But this is not local enough. So I'm doing this coordinate transformation, let's say, in a domain where there's a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, for this transformation, the domain is global. Because if I have P1 and if I have Q1 and Q2, I can compute P1 and P2 in a unique way. And if I give you P1 and P2, I can compute the Q1 and Q2 inverting this matrix uh, in a unique way without singularity. So this transformation may or may not have singularity, but uh, we assume that uh, we work at least in a domain local or global, uh, large enough, where the inversion, uh, the invertibility is unique. And of course, we can uh, move to the differential level, just like we did there. So we have a P dot, which is, remember, this is a, the Jacobian of the transformation, not necessarily the Jacobian of the direct kinematics or of the task kinematics. It's just, I'm using the J notation because many times we do this by changing coordinate with respect to the task variable or the Cartesian variable, but this can be uh, as general as you can imagine. And of course, locally, we invert this. And because uh, we, we will need in the new coordinate P to leave on the right-hand side of the Euler-Lagrange equation, the non-conservative forces doing work on the new coordinate P, the principle of virtual work applies, and if J is the differential mapping of the coordinate transformation, then J transpose will be the differential mapping between the new generalized coordinate, uh, sorry, the new uh, non-conservative forces doing work in P and the original non-conservative forces doing work on Q. This is why I added the Q index in order to make this distinction, okay? And uh, since in the model we had also the acceleration, we have to move up one step further this transformation, so write also the acceleration in terms of the new coordinates as related to the state and the acceleration in the original coordinates. And then we have also the inverse mapping here, so we are assuming that this Jacobian of the transformation is non-singular, at least locally, as I said. And so we bring everything on the other side like this. And now we have Q, Q dot, Q double dot. We have also an expression for UQ and we just plug in everything into the equation one. Quite simple. And this is the result. Now I have M of Q. In place of Q double dot, I introduce this expression. And I'm isolating the acceleration P double dot from this part, and all the rest goes into the second, second term. So we have m of q, again, j to the minus 1, this part uh, with the minus sign before, so j dot, j to the minus 1, p dot, and then again n of q, q dot, and on the other side I have j transpose of q, up. Now, this is still an hybrid object, an hybrid things, thing. Why? Because I would like to see everything written in terms of P, P dot, and P double dot. While here I have Q, Q, here I will have also Q dot inside J dot. I have a Q dot here, but 
I'm not doing this explicitly, but I'm assuming that wherever you find Q, you will substitute F to the minus 1P, and wherever you find Q dot here and inside this J dot, you will substitute this expression where Q is F to the minus 1P. But in fact, we don't need to do this, but implicitly we could do this. Still, we are not yet in a satisfactory situation, at least for two reasons. Why? Because on the right hand side, we would like to see only UP, just like we had only UQ in the original equation. And this is one reason. The other reason is, if this matrix uh, is the new inertia matrix multiplying the acceleration P double dot, well, it should be definite, positive definite and symmetric. And certainly this is not symmetric. So, we solve this uh, strange object and we convert it into the dynamic model uh, which has all the characteristics that had the original one only in the new coordinate P by pre-multiplying this equation by J to the minus transpose. So we will eliminate this block here and symmetrize J minus transpose m j to the minus 1 is now a symmetric matrix and it can be shown that it's also positive definite if the original one was positive definite. So if we do this, we end up with this model. And this is the new model, let's say, uh, when using the coordinate p and uh, wherever you see q and q dot, you have to replace. No? The inner substitution are implicitly there. They don't need, you don't have to do this when you're doing computation. We will see this uh, at, uh, in due time. But if you wish, you can replace things there. But now you recognize that on the right hand side, you have the non-conservative generalized force performing work on P and not on Q. Uh, and formally, you recognize different block in the, so now you expand again N with C plus G. I've added a, a subscript P to characterize that this is the inertia matrix uh, in the coordinate P. These are the Coriolis and centrifugal terms in the coordinate P. These are the gravity terms in the coordinate P. And of course, UP, we have already commented that. Now, if you match the single element, you find that m of p is j to the minus transpose m to the j, j to the minus 1. On purpose, I'm not putting uh, dependence there, but of course, everything should be written in terms of the uh, new coordinate p. And this is symmetric, positive definite, just like m. Of course, this holds out of singularities. When, when we have singularity, this new set of coordinates boils down, so it cannot be used any longer. Okay. Then what else? The gravity term is just j to the minus transpose times g, while for the Coriolis and centrifugal term, you have a special effect. Not only you have the original Coriolis and centrifugal uh, generalized forces, c, pre-multiplied by j to the minus transpose, but you have extra terms coming from, let's say, the curvature of your transformation. In fact, the fact that J is not constant, so you have J dot. And this term has a velocity P dot here. This is only function of Q, so of P, of Q, so of P, but J dot is a function of P and P dot, in fact, just like in the original coordinate. So you have a p dot here and a p dot there. So this is another quadratic term in p dot, just like this was. So again, this can be recognized as really the velocity terms, which are quadratic in the new generalized uh, velocities, p dot, uh, which needs to be included in the model. Of course, if your transformation is a linear transformation with a Jacobian, which is constant, so J dot is, de is zero, this term is no longer there. In fact, when we are 
for instance, doing this transformation where the J is given by this expression here, uh, this term needs not to be included. Now let me cancel uh, this second nonlinear transformation. So we don't care about this. We care about this P2. We don't care about this one. Okay. So here we are considering this linear transformation. Now I invite you, so this is uh, not the whole story. Uh, there are more terms, for instance, this CP term can be factorized since it's quadratic in P dot. We, we can factor out a P dot and leave a matrix which is S of P function of P and P dot implicitly. And you can do several factorization, but certainly uh, you can have that M dot P minus 2SP is skew symmetric as long as you're using the factorization S in C, which gives an, uh, a factorization together with the original M. Okay, so the same property are transformed. And as I said, if P is the end effector pose, in case you have the same number of, uh, let's say, Cartesian coordinate, then the number of joint coordinate, then what we have obtained in yellow is the dynamic model of the robot in Cartesian coordinate. And we will see that this is very useful when we will deal in particular with controlling the interaction of the end effector with the environment, which typically occurs at the Cartesian level. So our controller, uh, at least in principle, are designed using this model and not the original model in the joint coordinate. Uh, my question here now, uh, UP uh, has been obtained by the transformation J to the minus transpose times UQ. So my question is, if you have this robot and you have two motors doing work on the Qs, or you have an arrangement of motors. One motor is doing work on Q1, which is equal to P1, and another motor is doing work directly on P2. So it's moving the absolute uh, position of the second link with respect to the x-axis, not the relative one. So the motor is not placed here, but probably is placed here and drives remotely this. Now, if you call UK u of q as u1 and u2, question, what are the two coordinates of up that produce work on p1 and p2? And the relation is given by this, but you may su be surprised that if you perform the computation, you don't uh, obtain, for instance, uh, that the, the generalized torque that perform work on P1 and P2 are U1 and, let's say, the sum of U1 and U2 here. In fact, you have to apply this formula. Let's do it as an exercise. So the Jacobian is this one. So we need to compute Jacobian to the minus 1 when the Jacobian is this one. And this Jacobian to the minus 1 is just the inverse, so it's 0, 0, 1, minus 1. Okay? But here you need to transpose this inverse. Remember, transposition and inversion of a square matrix commute. But, so j to the minus transpose is now 1 minus 1, 0, 1. So if you do this, the two components of up in the model using the p coordinates, so the absolute coordinates, will be related to the original motor torque you're doing this times U, U, UQ, so you have U1 minus U2 here and only U2 there. I think that this is rather unexpected in the first place, but it's the natural consequence of the transformation of coordinates. 
Instead, I will leave you as uh, uh, an open question. But what happened exactly when we are considering a change co of coordinate between the joint space and the Cartesian space or the task space? What if this task space or Cartesian space has less dimension than the dimension of the joint space? First of all, we cannot invert the task Jacobian or the uh, direct kinematic Jacobian of the robot. We may need to use pseudo inverse. But second, uh, suppose that we have a, a seven degree of freedom robot with, so Q lives in a se seven dimensional space and we are considering position and orientation in the 3D space. So P uh, a mini with a minimal representation of orientation is six dimension. Of course, we can do all this transformation. We may replace the inverse by a pseudo inverse or by something similar according to all what we learn on redundancy. But still we end up with six second order differential equation while we started with seven. So certainly this description of the dynamics of the system is not complete. There's something missing because we were using first seven generalized coordinates and these six new coordinates are not the complete set. We should have an extra one because seven should remain seven. So we can write the model in the P coordinate, but there will still be an additional second order differential equation missing. So we could use, for instance, one of the seven coordinates in the joint space to complete the transformation. So pay attention when you would like to have a complete description, then the number of generalized coordinates cannot change. But even in that case, if you're using part of the coordinates as being a, a the P as part of the transformation and you have a, a task dimension which is strictly less than the dimension of the joint space, then for that part of the model, you may use some generalization of the concept that we have seen uh, for redundancy also at the dynamic level. The last uh, topic that I would like to cover today relates to the use of uh, the dynamic model within trajectory planning and in particular within a particular uh, sorry more specifically within a particular problem that is how to compute the torque that executes a trajectory so solving an inverse dynamic problem when I have already computed this through the inverse dynamics for a, an original trajectory and I realized that the torque that I would need are not feasible with respect to some uh, bounds, some limits that I have on actuation, actuation torque. So one thing that we could do is to scale down motion. Uh, we have seen this at the kinematic level, but what happens if we are considering torque bounds and we are executing a nominal desired trajectory and we compute torques, nominal torques that are uh, in excess of the bounds, how can we scale down motion? And similarly, we could also consider the opposite problem. Suppose that we have given a, a, a trajectory, so a path and a timing law, and we have found that the torque needed to uh, execute that trajectory is well within the limits of the actuation. So we would like to speed up things in order to be more efficient, to complete the motion in uh, less time. So how can we address this problem without making trial and errors or without recomputing on a scaled trajectory the torques, but using what we have already computed in the original, uh, on the original motion. So, suppose that we have, uh, so we will see that we have a closed form expression for that in the assumption that the scaling of the trajectory is uniform, which means that you slow down or you accelerate motion, so the timing law, uniformly along the whole trajectory, not accelerating first, decelerating 
uh, later and so on. So you do uniform scale. In that case, we have a closed form expression, which does not require to recompute all the elements of the model. So to resolve, uh, solve again a, a completely new inverse dynamic problem. So let's set up the, the, the problem in the following way. Suppose that we have a, let's call it an original trajectory, QD of time. Uh, we move uh, in a finite interval, zero capital T, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever you wish. And now suppose that we would like to rescale time. So we don't change the path. So we are implicitly using the separation of path and timing law. So the geometric path remains the same. But we would like to change the timing law. So from the original time t to a new uh, timing law, which is a function of t. It should be a non uh, decreasing, in fact, strictly increasing function of time. So we don't want to reverse the new time. So either we, uh, um, we speed up or we slow down motion and in a different way at each instant, but it should be an increasing function of time just because we don't want to reverse time. Now, in this new time scale, so R of t, we are executing the same path. <coughs> so if <coughs> in the original time t, we were at a certain q desired of, of t, in the scaled time r of t, so in the new instant computing through this transformation of the timing law, we should be in a scaled trajectory, we, and I'm using qs as the result of this scaling, which is exactly the same value as before. So in a new instant, we are tracing exactly the same geometric path that we traced in the original timing law. This is a basic thing. So we are not changing geometric motion. We are just changing the timing on the trajectory. So what happens, however, to the relation of the velocity <coughs> in the original trajectory and, let's say, the velocity in the new scale trajectory? So if we call q dot desire the original velocity, so dq over dt, but now we have moved from uh, t to r of t, so we are taking the derivative of uh, the scaled trajectory with respect to the new timing law r, and then of the new timing law r with respect to time. So we do a chain rule differentiation. So let's, call, let's use the prime for denoting the derivative of the new scale trajectory with respect to the new timing law r. So this dqs over dr will be q prime s. And then uh, dr over dt is the conventional derivative. So it's the time derivative of the uh, mapping between the original time and the new time r. So we call this r dot. And if we move this one differential order farther, why? Because we would like to use the dynamic model, and we know that in the dynamic model also the acceleration appears. So we do the second derivative of time of the original, so the acceleration along the original trajectory. And this will be just the time derivative of this. So the time derivative of this quantity. And now in terms of the scale trajectory, uh, we have uh, the derivative of this with respect to time is divi divided in a derivative with respect to the new time r and of the new time with respect to the old time and then multiplying r dot. And then the second term is just the derivation with respect to time of the second element in this product. So we keep qs prime times r double dot. Here inside this quantity, we will have a a second derivative of qs with respect to uh, the new time r, so we write this as q double prime s times r dot, but r dot is a scalar multiplied by r dot outside, so we have our r dot square here. Well, this is a computation that we have done in slightly different way several times. At this stage, it's purely kinematic, so we have just dealing with Position, velocity, acceleration, if we wish, jerk, and so on. But we don't need to 
proceed farther if we want to plug in now this quantity into the dynamic model. We have everything that we need. So uh, we could do this in general, but we don't get out of the problem. Uh, we don't have a closed form expression if we consider a generic uh, retiming. Let's consider now uniform scaling of time. So our function R of t, uh, strictly increasing function, will be just k times t. So if k, suppose that k is 2, and your trajectory, original trajectory, had time going from 0 to capital T equal 10 seconds, now for every instant of the original trajectory, so between 0 and 10 seconds, you're computing a new time which is twice the original instant. So in the new timing, you will go from 0 to k times capital T, 20 seconds. So your original trajectory was 10 seconds, now you have scaled time doubling the interval of time. You will execute exactly the same sequence of configuration in space, but in time you will uh, be in this configuration uh, every time twice later until you complete the whole motion in 20 seconds. So if k is equal to of course, if k is less than 1, still positive, so you are still have an, in, an increase of your, uh, uh, an increasing function of time, but you will slow down motion. So if your original, if you're using, for instance, k equals 0 0.5, then if the original trajectory was 10 seconds long, the new trajectory will last only 5 seconds. You will trace the sequence of config the same sequence of configuration but at sooner instant of time than before okay so if this is our choice this is called uniform scaling of time now those general expression simplifies so you can replace wherever you have a, a velocity original velocity in the original time q dot desired of t you will have a scale velocity uh, which is uh, from this expression, r dot is simply equal to k, and qs prime is the scale velocity in the new scaling uh, time, which is now r is now k times of t. Okay, so it's a new scaled instant, and the original velocity and the new velocity are related by a factor k. And of course, if k is uh, say greater than one, let's say two, then the, uh, you're going slower in fact. So the new velocity at the scaled instant of time will be the original one divided by k. So you bring k to the other one. So you're reducing speed. How? Linearly with the factor k. What about the acceleration? You use this expression but if r is k of t is linear in time, so the second derivative is zero, so what is, remains is only this. So the square of r dot, r dot is k, so you have a k square here. So you, what, what does it mean that if you're scaling uniformly the trajectory, velocity are scaled by the same factor k, acceleration are scaled by the square of this factor. And this, again, is nothing new if you compare this with the kinematic knowledge of trajectories that we have uh, detailed in the course of Robotics 1. But now we will plug in this expression into the dynamic model. You know? And the question is, now, what is the new input torque needed to execute the scale trajectory? Suppose for the time being that there is no dissipative term, so the torque on the right hand side is purely actuation torque that is being applied to the robot by the motors. The generalization is quite simple. So do we need to recompute on the QS, QS prime and QS double prime, uh, the scale trajectory? We have to resolve an inverse dynamic problem by reevaluating all the terms? Well, actually not. And the reason is, and the computation is as follows. 
So suppose that we have this uniform scaling. So the new torque on the scale trajectory evaluated in the new instant of time, which are k times the original instant, small t, is just evaluated by plugging qs, qs prime and qs double prime. Remember, these are the derivative with respect to the new timing law into the model. So this would be the computation that we redo from scratch if we don't use the property that we will now prove. So, but remember that the original or even this model are linear in the acceleration and quadratic in the velocities and nonlinear in the coordinates. Okay? But we know that the coordinate that will trace, the QS, they will be traced in new instant of time, but are exactly the same as in the original QD trajectory. Whereas these two properties of linearity in the acceleration and quadratic dependence on velocity is what really matters in our case. So let's, uh, we have computed already the torque profile on the original trajectory, the one that we labeled as QD, so on the original timing law. And we have the inertial part, linear in the acceleration, the original acceleration. The Coriolis and centrifugal term, quadratic in the velocities, the original velocity, plus a term, a gravity term, which depends only on the configuration. Now we replace to Q double dot desired and Q dot desired and Q desired, in fact, the new expression in terms of the new derivative. The QD will be exactly the same, although obtain at scaled instance of time, the acceleration will be k squared times the new acceleration. The Coriolis and centrifugal term will be evaluated in the same configuration scaled of the scaled trajectory, but with velocity which are k q prime of s, and the gravity term will be evaluated in the new scaled uh, configuration, which are exactly the same, but only in new times. But now, uh, the fact that this factor k is a scalar, so wherever I had the velocity, I'm replacing this new velocity. Since velocity appear only in quadratic term, I can factor out of each individual term within this vector a factor k square and leave inside just q prime of s. So the velocity in the new timing law. But there's a factor k square coming out of this term, just like a factor k square is there. And this is the trick. This is really the, the true property. So I can factor out a k square, k square there and obtain the inertial and the velocity dependent terms, whereas the gravity term has not been scaled. And now this part, uh, I recognize that it's part of the new torque. So the new torque, the tau s at the scale time kt, will be equal to this contribution up to the gravity term, which I need to subtract, because this term is not being scaled. So you see that the or original torque that I have, that I have already computed, is related to the new torque by this simple equation which is obtained by removing gravity and then adding gravity again. In fact, this is the relation, but I need to use this relation in the opposite way. So I need to evaluate the new torque, the original one, I had it already. So the new torque, I don't need to recompute the whole dynamics, inverse dynamics. I just take the original torque. I remove from there the gravity part at every instant. And then I scale this by a factor k square. And then I re-add the original gravity term, which has not changed because I'm passing through the same configuration where the gravity term is exactly the same. So I found a closed form expression for evaluating the new torque without doing extra computation. The only thing that I have to take into account while computing the original torque is to save the gravity part separately. Uh, not computing everything together. 
So save the gravity part and then compute the total one. And then take the total one, subtract the gravity, scale by k square, and then re-add gravity outside. And I will have the new torque in the new instant. Very simple. This is called the uniform dynamic scaling of trajectories. So taking into account the dynamics. Now, if k is larger than 1, we will typically reduce torque. If k is smaller than 1, we will speed up and increase in torque. But this is true modulo the presence of gravity. For instance, if gravity is not present, so we are moving on a horizontal plane, this is 0 and this is 0, then this is definitely true. So the whole torque will be scaled by k squared. However, this part is not being scaled, so this may uh, be a relevant part of the total torque or just a, a minor fraction or being completely absent. What is scaling are only the inertial torque and the velocity dependent torque. Let's do a, an example, a numerical example. So we're considering a rest to rest motion for a planar to our robot under gravity. So a two-arm arm moving in the vertical plane from a, an initial configuration to a final configuration. We're starting at rest, so with zero velocity and ending at rest. And in particular, uh, here I'm using my arm in order to, I could make a drawing, but I think it's clearer what I do. So I'm starting with this configuration, so the arm uh, in the downward equilibrium, so stretched like this, and I'm moving 90 degree the first link and 90 degree the second link. So I'm going from this rest equilibrium to this configuration, which is not an equilibrium unless I sustain with the torque the first joint. And I'm doing this motion, so the original motion is done uh, in 0.5 seconds, and half a second, doing this uh, quite uh, fast motion, and I'm using uh, as reference trajectory uh, a cubic polynomial, which goes from uh, minus uh, pi, my pi over 2, sorry, to 0 for the first link, and of course from 0 to plus pi over 2 for the second link, this is just the motion of the first link, but uh, the velocities and acceleration are exactly the same because we are doing a motion of displacement of 90 degrees for both joints, uh, but from different configuration to final configurations. So the velocity goes from zero to zero, so it's a quadratic function of time with a peak at the center instant, 0 0.25, and the acceleration for a cubic profile is a linear function of time. We start with a positive acceleration, we have zero acceleration where we have the maximum of velocity, and then maximum negative acceleration, so deceleration uh, at the end of the trajectory. And what we see here on the, for this desired motion with a given timing law, uh, and with a duration of 0 0.5 second, uh, here you see the torque profile, the blue, the blue continuous line, only for joint one. Uh, there's something similar for joint two, but just do this uh, analysis on joint one. So, and here in dashed, instead, you see the comp contribution to this total torque given just by the gravity term. So this is the total torque, it starts with about 35 newton meters at time zero and ends up with minus, I would say, 12 newton meters at the end. While in this torque, there is embedded the gravity torque, which starts from zero. Why? Because when I'm here, this is an equilibrium, natural equilibrium. I don't need any torque for staying here. While when I end up in this configuration, I will need a torque for joint one and no torque for joint two to sustain gravity because this is a local equilibrium for link two while this is not an equilibrium unless I don't apply a torque. In fact, the torque that I need to apply when the first link is uh, horizontal is about 10 newton meters. Okay? So this is just the gravity torque component. 
and at the initial configuration we have an equilibrium so the initial torque is zero while this non-zero value for the total torque since the gravity is zero so what is the torque that i need to apply at an initial time i'm starting with zero velocity so it's not a torque related to the velocity terms there's no contribution needed for the gravity term so all this torque is related to the fact that i'm starting with in initial configuration with a non-zero acceleration for both joints so it's the terms m of q at time zero times the acceleration desired at time zero that produces that 35 newton meter of torque for joint one so using the full model now suppose that uh, without taking into account limits no of course we will scale things because we see that this torque may be excessive uh, or maybe too small with respect to our capabilities so we need to accelerate so we don't care now about what are the actual the actual uh, uh, limits but we do this scaling uh, suppose that we want to go slower instead of doing the same motion so again from here to here in half a second we would like to double the duration so we use a factor k equal to so the new total time will be one second so we go slower so we go slower and here you can see maybe let me see if this is possible okay here you can see uh, the original profile so this was the original total torque the continuous line and this was the gravity torque from zero to a maximum value when the duration was 0.5 seconds now these are the profile on the same scale between minus 40 and plus 40 here i guess and you see that the total torque has been reduced while the gravity torque is exactly the same as before okay so uh, in fact we start with the total torque which is uh, uh, below 10 newton and end up with the total torque which is something more than uh, three or four newton while the total gravity torque is still the same now look what this has been recomputed by the formula without reevaluating the whole dynamic model and in fact if we look at uh, this uh, second uh, graph where we show the original torque uh, from its maximum to its minimum this is the total torque and uh, or probably this is just uh, oh sorry this is just uh, one uh, eliminating eliminating the gravity torque and up to 0 0.5 was the original one and this is the scaled one on a interval which is doubled as long so it lasts until one second so if we uh, okay sorry these are the uh, things that compensated so on on this graph just considering the component which is not including the gravity torque which does not scale we can recognize some values for instance at time 0 0.1 uh, we had a total torque which is evaluated at this instant was that original total torque but since we have eliminated the gravity part this residual which is only related to inertial Coriolis and centrifugal torque acting at joint one is exactly equal to 20 newton meters so at time 0 0.1 we had 20 newton not due to gravity now we know already that at double this instant so at 2 because k is equal to 2 times 0 0.1 so at the instant 0 0.2 we know that this part the one that is independent of gravity has been scaled by k square so i i should really find a value which is 20 divided by 2 square so 5 newton meters in fact this is exactly 5 newton meters okay so you see that we don't really once we have the plots or just the numerical data we don't have to go back to the dynamic model to recompute the new torque uh, other interesting factor for instance if you
take this value at some instant, let's say 22, um, 0.22 seconds, we had this component was equal to zero, then twice the time at 0 0.44 second, of course this is scaled by four, but it was zero, it remains zero. So the crossing point of the zero just moves uh, to a new point. And finally, uh, when we end up here, uh, this is whatever value it is, I know that the final time this value will be scaled by two to the square, so by a factor of four, because we have removed gravity. Of course, then we have to re-add gravity and the total torque will be this. Mm? Greater or smaller, this depends on the evolution of the gravity term, which is the only one that is not scaling. So by this, uh, it's easy to recompute uh, the new scaling, uniform scaling, so the new duration of the trajectory in such a way that you bring, uh, you, you let all the torques become feasible with respect to some bound, or bring a feasible torque up to the limit, at least for one torque being uh, the largest possible. So reducing, making as fast as possible the motion. There will be only, one, in general, one torque in saturation for at least one instant. Of course, in order to speed up the motion along that trajectory, you will like that at least in every instant there will be a torque in saturation. Okay, so that the geometric path is fixed, but you could do uh, the minimum time motion along that geometric path. This problem can be solved. There is a nice algorithm doing this in a quite efficient way, but it's way too complex to be presented during this lecture. Uh, so this is the minimum time problem along a assigned geometric path for going from one configuration to another configuration. But the path is fixed. And the solution goes through this type of consideration. The only thing is that you have to use a non-uniform scaling of your timing law. So the new timing law will accelerate first, decelerate later, and be non-uniform so that you exploit at maximum the robot capabilities on that trajectory. The first contribution that solved this problem uh, is due to Sheen and McKay or to Bobro, Gibson and Dubovsky uh, in papers developed in the 80s of the last century. But later, lately there has been many new contributions that speed up computational time very efficiently. I would like to conclude here by addressing just by some video uh, a similar problem. So going from one configuration to another configuration, taking into account the full dynamics of the robot, but without a prescribed uh, path, and trying to minimize different objective function globally along the whole motion. So this problem is an optimal control problem, which is uh, impossible to solve in close form in any event, so you have to address it through numerical optimization techniques, but here I found two interesting uh, uh, solutions by a group, a German group from the Technical University of Munich, which compare on a three degree of freedom robot two solutions that minimize globally some integral objective functions so over the whole motion, bringing the robot from this configuration with the end effector here to another configuration with the end effector here, in one case minimizing the total motion, so without prescribing what is the trajectory, just go from rest to rest in minimum time under constraint on maximum torque for the one, two, three, the three joints of this manipulator. And the other optimization problem that they have solved was doing exactly the same with the same constraint, but minimizing the energy spent for doing the motion. It's a completely different criterion. In one case, I would like as fast as possible uh, saturating my actuator and using the maximum energy that I can, 
because my objective is minimizing time. In the other case, is I would like to go from one position to the other. I don't care when I will be there. Of course, I would like to be there soon, but my minimum time is not the objective. The objective is using the least energy as possible. So this is more, let's say, sustainable in the terminology of, current, of the current politics and hopefully of future politics. So we will see that this problem has been solved numerically. In the video, we will see the two solutions. And I encourage you to imagine what will be the joint trajectory of the robot and, of course, of the end effector as well, in one case and in the other. So think about, and now we'll see the evolution. First, the minimum time one. Uh, yeah. First, it is shown, the solution is shown uh, in slow motion, 15 times slower. You see that the robot does not go directly to this point. Uh, this is surprising. But is in fact acquiring energy through this falling and, uh, let's say, um, launching phase until it gets to the final position. And now we will see this reversed and then executed in real time. And the real time will be 132 seconds with an expense of energy of 306 joule or whatever it is. So this is the final motion. Now look at the, look at the second solution. So now we are really trying to minimize energy. And this is again a slow motion, a completely different motion in the joint space and trajectory, uh, slowly getting up to the point and then falling down on the final configuration. This is the slow motion. And now reverse and in real time, here, the minimum value of energy, so the total energy expend expenditure is 6.14 as opposed to 306, while the total time is 1.6 1 seconds as opposed to 132. Of course, you cannot compare the intensity, but the result is that here you're minimizing time and expending a lot of energy. Here you're minimizing energy and expending more time for doing the same motion. The result is completely different. Both motion are not kinematic motion. It's something that I could not have predicted if I had not used the model in order to simulate under the action of this command the motion of the robot. And this command had been computed for globally minimizing two different dynamic criterion. Minimum time under con limited constraints on torques, uh, constraints of torques, and uh, minimum energy under the same torque constraint. And this concludes uh, this part uh, of analysis of uses of the dynamic model uh, as derived by the Newton, uh, by the Euler-Lagrange formulation. Thank you for listening.